Hey, good evening. Uh, this is uh, Dr. Purush Babar with the Urology Group uh, in Cincinnati, Ohio. Uh, thanks so much uh, for for tuning in to this. Uh, what we hope will be informative and timely uh, session. Uh, I think uh, I just wanted to commend everyone for for uh, you know tuning in this evening. Uh, this is by far our biggest uh, webinar on this topic that we've had. Uh, in, in the past uh, year and a half. So uh, I think that, you know, it's a new year. I think as men, we should all challenge ourselves to take better ownership of our health. Uh, and that is emotional health, physical health, and part of that is sexual health. And so I think this is uh, a good first step and to just get uh, informed and get some knowledge on this and uh, go from there. So, uh, you know, we'll, we'll get started here in a second. Just a few things. I think the best part um, of a session like this is if if we keep it interactive. So if, uh, you know, in the chat box uh, on the side of the screen, if you want to type some questions, uh, I will uh, certainly try to get through those. So, you know, we'll definitely get through some slides, but then I think I want to try to answer some, some questions for y'all as best as I can uh, to make this applicable to everyone. All right. Uh, so, so my name's uh, Purush Babar. I'm one of the urologists here with the urology group. Um, so I grew up in Melbourne, Australia, uh, and then I moved to the States uh, for high school. And uh, so I've kind of moved around a lot in my life. Uh, I went to Wake Forest for undergrad and medical school in North Carolina. And I think one of the best and maybe luckiest things that happened to me is that I was able to be selected to go to the Cleveland Clinic for my urologic residency. So I think this is the preeminent uh, urologic institute in the country. And so I was one of five residents uh, to get trained uh, for six years under who, some of the world experts in really all facets of urology. So we got exposed to things from kidney transplantation to cancer to stones. And really what always um, really was my passion uh, was, was genital urinary reconstruction and men's health and ED and prosthetics. So I really tailored my six years there uh, to that experience and just learning the latest and greatest and that, that, we, we, they, that we could offer patients. And then I was fortunate enough to be selected to stay on for a, a one-year fellowship in, in you know, these topics and, uh, and, and really learned a lot. So those are some of my specialties that uh, I, I um, have expertise in. Um, and then I see patients uh, out of our Norwood and Eastgate locations. So um, to dive into the, uh, the topic at hand today, so erectile dysfunction. Okay, so what is it, who has it, and what causes it, right? So erectile dysfunction, you know, is, is, we define it as the ongoing inability to achieve or maintain an erection firm enough for intercourse. So um, I think the, the big part of this definition that I think about is it, that it's a subjective thing. So for what one man, you know, they're happy with an, an erection that, is, you know, let's say an eight out of 10, another man may not be happy with that. And that's where I think that it's important that men seek our, you know, treatment and, and understanding of, of, you know, what they can do and, and, and you know, uh, what the next steps would be. So it is very prevalent, you know, I, you know the, I, I'm so happy that everyone is tuned in today. You are not alone. That is the main thing I want to stress tonight that, you know, as, as we age, it's, it's kind of in essence a part of aging many times that erectile dysfunction will happen. So approximately one in five men over the age of 20 will experience ED in their, laf in their lifetime. And 50% of men over the age of 50 have some degree of erectile dysfunction. I think the earlier we can address it, we can try to hone in on some, you know, root causes and some um, other symptoms that are associated with it, the better we can treat it, the more options we have for you. So I think that coming in and, and, and understanding, uh, you know, sorry, tackling the problem head on uh, early on is important. Uh, and so approximately 30 million American men are affected. And I, I can tell you, I mean, we treat a lot of men, but I, we do not, you know, as you're all just treat close to that many. And I think that we, this is, you know, education seminars like this to get the word out there are absolutely critical in, in addressing this problem head on. So um, how an erection works, I mean, I think essentially this is, this is a little too busy, this slide, but the way I think about it is you need more inflow of arterial blood than there is outflow. So, and, and essentially there are three things that I think about with an erection, the arteries, veins, and nerves. So an, an impairment in any of these can cause ED, right? And so if there's not enough blood flow in, or if 
blood is leaking out too fast, so then you may not maintain the erection and nerves. So diabetics, for instance, or people who've had prostate surgery, the nerves may be affected. So then you may not be able to initiate or maintain an erection. So, you know, th those are the, the three general things we think about uh, for ED. Now it is common causes of ED, uh, medications. So some, some blood pressure medications, psychiatric medications, medications that manipulate your hormones for prostate cancer. These can uh, definitely cause erectile dysfunction, pelvic surgery. So when, I, when they say that, we think about prostate cancer treatment. We think about uh, various colorectal cancers or, you know, lo lower abdominal cancers that uh, affect the nerves that, that, that run to the penis. Uh, low testosterone, very important, I think, uh, that this be at least uh, thought about uh, in your evaluation. So if so, a man is having low sex drive, fatigue, energy loss, weight gain, you know, I think it's important to, to potentially draw a testosterone level. And repleting that sometimes can certainly help uh, regain some erections. Now, it may not help fully, but if you don't address the low testosterone, then we can throw uh, all the other uh, you know, medications at you, but it may not work as well. So I think it's important to, to uh, get a firm understanding of if the testosterone levels are normal. Radiation treatment for generally for cancer can definitely um, cause erectile dysfunction. And then, I mean, this is the last one here. I, I cannot underscore enough. Our mental health, depression, anxiety. Uh, this is so critical, you know, and, and, and um, it is something that I'm seeing more of since COVID started a few years ago. I think that there's a lot of stressors that we have in our lives and, and we sometimes don't even maybe have a full grasp of them. So sometimes that is an underlying cause of ED. And I think we're seeing more patients at a younger age uh, with, with ED. 40% of men over the age of 40, believe it or not, can have the beginnings of erectile dysfunction. I think a lot of this has to do with uh, stress, depression, and anxiety. So... This is um, an important slide that I think any physician would endorse. I think you need to improve your overall health and I think uh, you know you can help with your erection. So maintaining a healthy body weight through diet, exercise, losing weight, uh, losing adipose tissue, limiting alcohol, smoking. You have to quit smoking. I mean, it is, it is the worst thing you can do for your health uh, and, and in quitting it will help your erections. Uh, it will help really every facet of your life. So, so you know, doing that is important, reducing stress and, and sleeping well. Um, so urological issues that I, I wanna just touch upon tonight that are related to erectile dysfunction. So low testosterone, 40% uh, of men over the age of 45 can have a low testosterone and uh, this percentage rises as we get older. Peyronie's, uh, this is an adult onset acquired penile curvature, about 10% of men over the age of 50 can experience this. And um, this is vastly undertreated. I think that there have been commercials that you may see with a bent carrot uh, on, on Hulu and things like that, that have brought this condition to the limelight a little bit. And I think that's important because uh, a lot of men just suffer with this, where they have this very crooked, deformed penis and they cannot penetrate during sex. Uh, they, they, they're pain to the partner. And so, uh, you know, it's, it's something that we, we want to address. And then certainly prostate cancer is, is something that we treat as urologists that can go hand in hand with erectile dysfunction. So let's start with low testosterone. So, um, as men, our, our bodies produce testosterone. And as we age, sometimes the, the incidence of, of low testosterone can rise. And it's more common in certainly obese men because, uh, the, the, the fat cells can convert testosterone to estrogen. Uh, and so that's one thing, or diabetics have lower testosterone at times, high cholesterol, high blood pressure go hand in hand with this. So some of the signs and symptoms uh, of low testosterone are listed here, fatigue, loss of energy, decreased muscle mass, increased body fat, loss of hair, hot flashes, and then low libido. Uh, and then uh, some of the mental or emotional aspects uh, are also uh, listed here. And then also, um, one part that is erectile dysfunction is, is very, goes hand in hand with low testosterone. So, um, you know, when we see you, we want to at least address upon this. Now, if you have excellent sex drive and you're, you know, working out, things are good, then maybe, you know, your testosterone's not the issue. But, you know, in a lot of men I'm seeing, uh, you know, we do like to check this and make sure that it doesn't need to be repleted in addition to treatment options for erectile dysfunction. So some of the options that we have for treating uh, low testosterone that's gels or solutions that are topical and you know about 70 to 80 percent of men can respond to this uh, generally now if those don't work then we go to second line treatment options then these can include oral medication nasal sprays patches pellets or injections now it's 
a bit of complex how we do this, but you know, we have a specialized men's health team. Um, so with, with uh, uh, two of our physician's assistants, Melissa Helton and Mary Garrett, who do an exceptional job. So through our pharmacy, uh, we, we replete the testosterone and then we really make sure we check the labs. I think this is the absolute key part of this, that you, you, this is not something where you want uh, you know, a random a low T clinic, honestly speaking, doing this, you, you should ask them, where did you do your medical degree? And where did you do your urology residency and fellowship? If they can't answer that, I mean, I, I would not go there personally, I would not get my plumber to do my taxes, I would not have my lawyer change the oil in my car. I, I think, every, you know, you should have your urologist do your testosterone, you should have, you know, so, so that's all I would say about that. But, um, you know, we are we are trained in this, we, we do this on a day to day basis. And the key is, why testosterone sometimes gets a bad rap is yeah, if you take someone's levels into the thousands and make them on bodybuilder levels, of course, you can have heart attacks and strokes. I mean, but we know that too much of a good thing can be a bad thing, right? So if we, it's important to maintain testosterone levels in a, in a uh, tight range. And, and, and as long as that's done, I think it, it's, it's, a, it's an excellent therapy that can help men uh, achieve, be their best self. So, so something to consider and, and something that we, we do a lot of at the urology group. Now, next thing I want to talk about is Peyronie's disease. So this is an adult onset acquired penile curvature, um, and it and it can cause uh, indentation, penile deformities, loss of length upon erection, and it even goes hand in hand with erectile dysfunction. So. Um, the, 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 we think that this is due from a plaque or scar tissue that is formed in the penis and nine to 13 percent of men over the age of 50 will have this so it's it, you know, one in ten men is, has this now we think this happens uh, a lot of times when you're having sex and you have ed and it's just a little bit of hinging uh during sex and then there can be some um uh, tears in the inner lining of the penis called the tunica and then there's these nine to 13 percent of men can have scar tissue deposition at that area of, of, of micro tear. And then the scar tissue is not as elastic as regular tissue and hooks the penis. So we've seen uh, curvatures up, down, left, right, or a combination of, of all of these. And essentially, you know, patients with Peyronie's many times will have loss of length because my fingers are the same length and all of a sudden one is shorter than the other. So it, it robs men of their length and then it becomes, you know, source of stigma they don't want to have sex they don't come in and get a, a dress but there's we have um options to, to to help with this now so some of them are traction devices so these are to stretch the penis when it's flaccid to uh you know decrease the curvature Zyoflex is a medication that we inject a few cycles into that fibrous plaque that you can see uh, in this diagram to break down the scar tissue and then the surgical options uh, ranging from plication, incision and excision and grafting or penile implants to help straighten the penis. And uh, if you have this issue, you know, it's, it's a bit of complex discussion, but we would we would go into what we think is, is, is our best treatment option. Then prostate cancer. So, so uh, prostate cancer is the most common cancer in men outside of skin cancers. And so one in nine men in their lifetime, let me repeat, one in nine, so it's so common, will have prostate cancer in their lifetime. So uh, it's not the actual prostate cancer we think that can cause erectile dysfunction, but some of the treatment options. So, you know, I, 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 you have to treat the prostate cancer in a lot of these cases. And so whether it's radiation, surgery, hormonal manipulation, or some of the other treatments like cryo, proton beam, HIFU, they, they can cause uh, issues where the you know the the let's say the nerve the neurovascular bundle that runs along the prostate can be damaged or there's um you know as a byproduct of treatment and then uh, essentially erections uh can can be impaired so um do i have it here yeah so so a little bit more about that so so uh 45 to 55 percent of men after uh prostate cancer treatment can have erectile dysfunction um and 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 essentially you, you know we we see it um upfront more so with surgery but then that the erections generally recover whereas uh with radiation up front you don't see it but then two to three years later there can be in some certain patients some erectile dysfunction and i think that you know patients who've had prostate cancer it's very important they they come see a, a men's health specialist just to understand is there options for their for their erections and the answer that universally speaking uh is that we can generally do something unless you know, your cardiologist says, you know, we, we you can't, and, and that's very rare. So I, I've seen men 
uh, who, who have had prostate treatment in the 90s, believe it or not, and then they come in 25 years later and we can still you know, salvage them. Now, sure, had we seen them earlier, we could have helped them with better length and girth because there is atrophy of the penis. But it's not as if that if you haven't you know, used it in de a decade or two, we can't, we have no options. Some people just kind of give up on that part of life. And, and you know, I, why, you know, like, like it's, it, you should never have to do that. So, you know, come see us and, and it, it's never too late. Um, so some of the treatments for erectile dysfunction, just to, to, to go through. So um, oral medications, vacuum erection devices, ultrasound wave therapy, which is a newer uh, modality, which has uh, gained popularity, um, and then injections or penile implants. So let's go kind of go through these one by one. So oral medications, uh, these uh, are, are called PD-5 inhibitors. They increase blood flow to the penis. Now they do require sexual stimulation. They're effective, you know, in, in the majority of men, um, but they're not as effective in certain populations. So diabetics is one that I think about because diabetics generally have more um, severe forms of erectile dysfunction, um, especially if your blood sugars are not well controlled. Uh, and then also people who've had prostate procedures, prostate surgery for prostate cancer, you know, sometimes the pills are not as effective, but, um, you know, sometimes they are. And, and it, it, you know, they, they, they're, it's a low hanging fruit in my opinion, because you can take the pill and see if it works. And if it doesn't, then, okay, you move to the next step. Uh, issue is that the insurance coverage can be spotty at, at times. Um, but, and, and there are some side effects as, as listed below that we do see uh, with Viagra, Cialis, Levitra, Stendra, the PD-5 inhibitors. Now, um, you know, just to go into the two more common, most common uh, PD-5 inhibitors. So, so Viagra uh, is, is the one that uh, most people have heard of, the blue, the blue pill, uh, as it's colloquially called. So it uh, takes about 30 to 60 minutes to work, lasts maybe about four hours. And um, it's pretty dependent on, on, you know, if you have an empty stomach or not. Um, and I do see at times people do have sometimes side effects to Viagra, mainly a stuffy nose, headache, flushed face, uh, things of that nature, because it, as, it, as it increases blood flow to the penis, it also increases blood flow to the head. And that's kind of how those symptoms come about. Then there's Cialis or Tadalafil. So it takes at least an hour to work. This is called a weekend pill because it can last up to 36 hours. Uh, it can be taken with or without food. So that's always a, a bit of a, a benefit with it. And then there's also a daily option with Cialis, which I think is uh, an excellent option. I, I prescribe it quite a lot. And so um, this is a 2.5 milligram or 5 milligram daily dose that kind of creates a bit of a basal um, uh, let's say drug dose that's in the system. And then you can sometimes take a situational boost, you know, a few hours before sex. Um, and also in patients who have an enlarged prostate, who have some voiding or peeing issues, a daily option can help uh, with, with peeing a little better too. So you get a bit of a two for one with erections and uh, voiding uh, complaints with, with the daily Cialis. So it is a good option. Um, so, so uh, just a, a, a plug for our pharmacy. So we have a pharmacy in Norwood and, and uh, we uh, have no waiting lines uh, like they do at local pharmacy. Um, you get to talk uh, you know, to someone on the phone uh, pretty easily and we mail it anonymously. And uh, it's run by Melissa Ruder, who's an, an excellent uh, pharmacist and uh, just great patient care. We hear great things. And so there's no membership costs. It's not like a men's health clinic. Um, so something to consider uh, just because a lot of times the these medications are cost prohibitive. I know, for instance, for our Viagra, it's about 60 cents a pill. Uh, we bypass insurance. So, you know, I think it's a great option and, and, and something that's very convenient and our patients love. So um, next is a vacuum erection device. So I think let me show a, a little schematic of it. So it's a hollow tube that's placed over the penis. It can be hand or battery pump operated. And essentially the vacuum uh, will pull blood into the penis and you have to have a constricting band many times that's put at the base to prevent leakage of blood out. Um, once the erection is achieved, you can remove the, the vacuum device and, and, and go from there. Now, um, it's effective. You know, I think that it does work, but the problem is that uh, it is at least 80, if not more percent uh, of patients who decide to to move on so the discontinuation rate is quite high because the spontaneity is a big problem that you have to you know put this constricting band on put this tube on your penis you know get the vacuum working and take it off so you know in that time the mood can kind of go away and then some patients do definitely have some penile discomfort that could be bruising that's noted especially in some patients who are on blood thinners and sometimes the rigidity just isn't enough with it but it is it is something that um you know, in some patients works well. 
I think there's certain populations we we think about. I, I at least think about using a vacuum. One is in patients after um, prostate cancer treatment. So sometimes it can be loss of length of the penis. So as a part of a prostate prostate removal um, prehab program, I like to put patients on a vacuum erection device to stimulate erections after surgery. That's one. Two is in patients um, who are deciding to undergo a penile implant. Um, sometimes doing the vacuum device uh, prior to surgery can help us get a longer implant in. So it's, it's, if they have it on hand, I think it's, it's good to, uh, they can use it before. So, you know, something to consider. Um, next is um, uh, ultrasound wave therapy or, you know, known uh, more commonly these days as penile shockwave, let's say. So, um, the, essentially, we, we have uh, all medual uh, penile shock, ultrasound wave therapy. So this um, helps restore natural uh, erectile function. Um, it's a painless uh, treatment um, that uh, is administered over six quick uh, painless 15-minute in-office treatments. Uh, the benefits are there's no expected side effects, no downtime, no pain, um, and can be a longer-lasting treatment. So the way this works is the, this is the, the key part of this is that first bullet point. It is focused, low intensity, extracorporeal shockwave therapy. So uh, there, there's, you know, these men's health clinics that, that will, uh, you know, pedal you shockwave. And, and so there's two types. There's this one that's listed, and then there's radial shock, uh, radial shockwave. So that shockwave, the depth of penetration is not enough to help. And, and we did that study at the Cleveland Clinic uh, about two or three years ago that showed there's no benefit over a sham study, whereas focused low intensity shockwave therapy or focal shockwave, uh, there are multiple randomized clinical trials uh, uh, out of Israel and Europe that show that there is a two to four point uh, increase in IIEF scores, which is a subjective scoring system uh, that patients will have a, a boost in their erections. Uh, and actually, we have done some of our own uh, uh, studies that we recently presented at our meeting to all our doctors, and, and we are we are uh, corroborating that, that there is an increase in uh, erectile parameters for well-selected patients. So I think the key is, you know, when, when we uh, look at who is a good candidate for this, I think someone who is early in their ED journey, who is still responding to oral medications, Viagra, Cialis. And we found that in those patients, uh, if, if they do uh, the, the, the ultrasound wave therapy, they can decrease their dose of their medicine or sometimes go off the medicine. They can have better response uh, to the medicine where they have more rigid erection, um, better for penetrative intercourse. So I think that um, this is an excellent therapy uh, in, in well-selected patients and it's painless uh, and, and, and it's something that I think uh, men should definitely consider, and it's come about uh, in the over the last few years. And actually, in Europe, it's in their European Urologic Association guidelines, right up there with uh, Viagra and Cialis. Uh, in 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 the U.S., it is not there yet. I do think it will be there in in the next few years. But uh, so so something to certainly consider. And then one thing I will tell you is, you know, there are a lot of. Uh, TV and radio ads, I, 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 like I said with before, you need to ask the people doing it, where did you do your medical degree? Where did you do your urology residency? Okay, so don't just go to some random clinic and, and, and just, you know, it needs to be the right thing. Okay, that's, that's you know, if, if they're not willing to, to have, a, a you know, someone trained uh, in, in urology speak to you, then I, I think twice. Um, so why the urology group? First group of urologists in Cincinnati who are offering ultrasound wave therapy. We have a staff of ED experts with decades of experience we've trained. It's our men's health team, uh, like a, who I mentioned before, Melissa Helton and Mary Garrett work with uh, me closely to, to kind of facilitate this program. Um, and we understand the medical history to treat the entire person. And this is the key that if we, if you call for a consultation and you know, you've had you're on injections and nothing's working, then we're not going to say do all Maduo. You know, that's that we're not going to push it. We we offer from pills all the way to surgery. So I don't need to push just the one thing I offer. So that's the key thing to remember. We will individualize what you need. And, and so that's one thing too. Um, and 
So this is uh, just a QR code and, and, the, and the phone number to call uh, if you're interested in Alma Duo specifically, and we'll go through a brief questionnaire to see if you qualify and then schedule a free 15 minute online consultation. And then uh, it's generally six sessions. Um, now it is not currently covered by insurance in the United States. So it's $2,000 for the six sessions or it's $400 per session. And if you pay up front, you get the last session free. Um, but uh, and I think you can use your FSA or HSA accounts too. So it's an excellent option in well-selected patients. Next is injections. Uh, so so sixty percent of men will see uh, success with injections, and essentially how it works is you self-inject a medication directly into the penis. Um, it typically takes five to twenty minutes, and then uh, it, it you you get a nice firm rigid erection. Um, it needs to be refrigerated or frozen many times, um, and then they do go you know they expire after sixty to ninety days. So that's one of the drawbacks, um, and you have to get it from a specialized pharmacy. Uh, the discontinuation rate for injections is probably also about 60 to 80 percent, reason being that there can be pain associated with it. They obviously, you're, you're injecting a needle into a sensitive part of the body. There can be development of scar tissue. Um, you, rarely, uh, there can be a prolonged erection uh, that's called a priapism that you need to go to the emergency room and have a procedure to drain the blood out of the penis. And then they can definitely be bruising and swelling, certainly more in patients who are on blood thinners. But I think this is a good option. Um, uh, in well-selected patients and, and certainly something that we, we, we do offer. Um, and then lastly, um, penile implant. And so uh, essentially if, if patients have tried, you know, the medical management that we've outlined b before and they're still just not having the erections that are um, satisfactory for penetrative intercourse. And I think this is something to, to, to very seriously consider. So essentially, uh, the, the, there's a, this is a three-piece device. Uh, so there's two cylinders that sit in the erection chambers of the penis. There's a pump that's in the scrotum and a reservoir of fluid that we tuck in the abdomen. So when the patient wants to have sex, you will grasp the pump that's in the scrotum, give it a few squeezes, and it will take make the cylinders go from deflated to inflated as it pushes the fluid from the reservoir uh, into the cylinders. And then when you're done, you press that little uh, valve that's on the uh, pump and it lets the fluid out back into the reservoir. So it does not change your orgasm ejaculation sensation. Uh, generally, it, it, it will uh, just give you an erection when you want it for as long as you want it. So even after you orgasm, you can still uh, continue to have sex, which is something that a normal man generally cannot do. Uh, so that's a perk of the penile implant. Um, and I think that uh, it, it, it is something that as men, you know, I, I, I do, you know, over about over 100 of these a year currently. And so, so uh, you know, we, we do a lot of penile implants, but men don't talk about this. And this is this is where I think we, we do ourselves a disservice. Like women get breast implants and no one bats an eye, right? And But men will come to me and say, no, doc, I'll do anything. I just not going to do the implant. But it's like they have severe, they're diabetic, they've had prostate cancer. I mean, really, I know that's the only thing that's going to work for them. But no, I won't do it. Okay, I mean, that's fine. But, you know, you have to realize this is a functional implant. This can regain your sexual life. This can get you intimacy back in your relationships. But, you know, it's a quick outpatient procedure. It takes an hour, hour and a half to do. You go home the same day, and then we see you four to six weeks later, and, and we show you how to use it. So it's something that yeah, I think we just need to keep an open mind to. And there's different types of implants. There's ones that don't have a pump on it, no reservoir, and patients, let's say, who are a little overweight and their penis has been sucked in, like a, what we call a buried penis, and they're peeing on themselves. We can put a malleable implant in, get some length back to the penis so they can stand up and pee again and also have sex. So that's a great option too. Um, so something to certainly consider uh, and, and, and just not, you know, shut ourselves off to is, is all I would say. So... Um, yeah, I think that's all I have for tonight. Um, you know, happy to answer any questions people have. So I have a few in the chat box. I'm going to start uh, working my way through. Uh, and if you have more, please, uh, you know, put them through. And and I would I would really uh, you know love to go through them. So I've just put our contact information up here. So you know, if there's any, you know, please you, you've tuned in tonight. I mean, make an appointment. Come see me. I, it would be an honor to to kind of just go through things. This is what I do every day. It's my passion, uh, and I would love to you know. Uh, help you with it. So here we go. Um, uh, can you get a penile implant while having a pacemaker? Great question. Yes. Answer is yes. Done many patients who have a pacemaker, uh, who have a defibrillator. As long as your cardiologist will clear you for surgery, uh, yeah, we can do it. Um, I've even done patients with artificial heart valve. That's probably the one that is a little 
more iffy. Reason being that those patients cannot generally stop their blood thinner. We've still done it. There's risks, but we can do it. Uh, but definitely pacemaker patients generally, I've found, can stop the blood thinner for a few days and, and we can do it. But we would just have, you know, be in close contact with your cardiologist and, 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 and go from there. Um, is it safe to add testosterone after treatment for prostate cancer? Uh, PSA went from 15.8 to less than 0.1. Uh, so that's a great question, okay? So this is a point of debate in, in the men's health, in the sexual health field. So I think that if your PSA has been low or, you know, you've had no evidence of biochemical recurrence for a few years, answer, you know, you'll say how long is that? Maybe two to three years if you've been cancer-free, then we can consider uh, you know, giving you testosterone. I'm okay. I'm more open to that in patients who've had prostate removal and their PSA is undetectable. Patients who've had radiation, we have to think, you know, it's, it's worth, we've got to think about it. We got to talk to your radiation oncologist. Uh, and if you've been doing well for a number of years, it's something that we can, we can consider, uh, in well-selected patients. Um, please address how emotional or mental issues are addressed. Great question. So, I think that we, we have a sex therapist that we uh, that we work with closely. Her name's Christy Haas, uh, and we uh, have patients, uh, you know, we can give you her contact information and to see her and, you know, go through that. And I think, you know, making sure you have, a, you know, a, a psychiatrist who potentially helps you as well. Uh, you know, and I, the, the, so those are probably the mainstays, and we certainly ask about it, um, but th that's, that's important. Um, next is... Uh, I went last year, they told me that and put on medication and it's still not working. Okay, so for this patient, I think uh, if, if, if we put you on a medication and it's not doing the trick, then I think, you know, uh, come come see me. I mean, I think that your, your options, I mean, I need to <laughs> kind of look no more about your medical history, but, you know, if medications haven't done the trick, then, you know, Alma Duo maybe not going to be your best bet. So I'm not going to try to put you on that. So either you go with injections or a penile implant and, you know, there's pros and cons like I outlined to both, but um, I think, I think one or the other can, can re help you regain your sexual life back. Um, costs for this treatment, I'm assuming there, there, we're talking about the ultrasound wave therapy. So $2,000 for six sessions generally. Um, and other side effects temporary or permanent to the Alma Duo. So, um, so all the randomized trials show actually really no side effects. So this is the great part of it that we have not seen any penile pain, no hematomas or blood collections in the penis. Um, and actually, it's the only guideline that it's in the in for in the American Urologic Association is penile pain. So interestingly, for patients who have penile pain that we cannot understand why they're having it, we can give ultrasound wave therapy. So, so you know, there's really no side effect to it uh, other than, I guess, the, the, the cost, okay? Um, I'm on Cialis and it's not working. I even, when I even doubled the dose, I was going to make another appointment. Do it. Yeah, can't wait to see you. Uh, if Viagra works, what does that indicate as the ED cause? Okay, so... Uh, I don't really understand. I mean, Viagra works. I mean, what, what Viagra does is it increases blood flow to the penis. We know that erectile dysfunction is the lack of blood flow to the penis. So, you know, when people say, what can you pinpoint the exact cause? I think the answer to that, I mean, barring like you've been shot in the penis, I mean, like you can say, okay, it was that day, that time. It's hard to say, right? It's multifactorial. I mean, it's probably your diet. It's comorbidities, high blood pressure, high cholesterol, diabetes. I mean, there's many things that are, are, you know, modifiable factors. So that slide that I showed with, you know, exercising, your diet, sleeping, not smoking, those absolutely matter. But at a certain point, if, if those still aren't doing the trick, then, you know, we, we have to explore options like pills, injections, Alma Duo, ultrasound wave therapy, penile implants. So, yeah. Can treatments overlap? Vacuum plus pill. Excellent question. Love it. Uh, yes, absolutely. So yeah, a lot of patients will do Cialis or Viagra and use a vacuum pump with it. Uh, and, and that works well for them. Uh, and, and it's something that, that, that they can certainly continue. Um, one thing to go over that I didn't mention is that what we do find, just like any blood pressure, diabetes medicine, at a certain point, people will start going up on the dose in Viagra, Cialis, or even injections, and then it may not stop it may stop working. You kind of hit a max dose and you can't go higher than that. So not a reason not to do it, but it, that's not uncommon. It's, it's something that is actually expected a lot of times. Um, 
Does ultrasound work on reversing scar tissue? Great question. So all the randomized controlled trials show that it 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 does not. If you're mention if you're if you're alluding to scar tissue that we see in Peyronie's disease, it does not. Right. So there is no evidence that I have seen that it decreases curvature to the penis. It, that it decreases that penile plaque that you see in, in Peyronie. So certainly, in, in the, as you saw in my slide, there was no mention of Alma Duo for Peyronie's disease, but it is for erectile dysfunction. So uh, be careful on the men's health clinics. They may try to, to sell you the, 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 the ultrasound wave therapy for Peyronie's. There's no evidence of that. Okay. Um, drawbacks of the implant. Great question. So so um, the two mon two complications I, I advise patients on before penile implant, there's a one to 2.5% risk of infection. So I worry about that in patients who are diabetic, especially patients who are HIV, you know, immunocompromised kidney transplantation, who are on immunosuppression. So, you know, those patients have a little bit of a higher risk, but you know, really any patient has that risk. Now, certainly we do a lot of things to minimize that risk. We um, give antibiotics before incision. There's a special way we cut the hair, even how we prep, you know, uh, scrub the area before surgery. I think big part of it is doing the case safely, but fast. You don't want someone who does the case surgery, you know, two times a year and takes three and a half hours, you know? So you wanna get the implant in fast, you know, hour, hour and a half quick and and, and close up, you know, you want, and, and th that helps uh, with the risk of infection. Then another, um, you know, a complication of the implant is the risk of device malfunction in the inflatable type. So just like your car tire can pop a leak, uh, an implant can can leak. Uh, it's just saline in there, so it's nothing uh, life threatening. But if that happens, then the implant stops working. In those patients, um, you would have to go back in, take the old implant out, and put a new one in. The risk of that is six percent at seven years. So ninety four percent of these uh, implants will still work seven years after they're put in. Um, and a new study just came out that showed that about fifty two point six percent of implants will be working twenty years after they're put in. So it's a coin flip twenty years out if it's working or not. And to me you know if, if that happens you, you just take it out put a new one and it's not 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 the biggest deal um what if we already see another urologist at the urology group for stones yeah no it's fine i mean look we we me and my partners we're all partners you know this is uh we, we want to have patients see who is uh specialized in that and and so you know i i don't do kidney cancer for instance i send it to my partner so they send Erect the men's health to me and some of my other partners uh, who specialize in it, and, and certainly uh, please see us, and, and we we can go from there. We, we we are a team at the urology group, and, and we, we we all work together. Um, what is the efficacy success rate of the Alma Duo option? Okay, so studies show two to four point increase in SHIM or IIEF scores. Uh, this is based on a twenty five point scale. Um, so that is is what we see on average so that you know some patients may get no benefits some patients get more than that um now so that that's the best way to answer that it's hard to to answer like this question of um how long will it last or uh what's the guarantee uh reason being that there's no guarantees in medicine there's no guarantee we're gonna wake up tomorrow alive right so so you can't make that the only you know data i can give you on how, you know, you know, efficacy, right? So I can't even tell you how long Viagra will last for someone, but I can tell you a penile implant, reason being a penile implant we put in, whether you eat 10 donuts, whether you're diabetic, whether you smoke after surgery, it doesn't matter, the implant's gonna work. But you know, how well, how you take care of your body and your health will affect efficacy of injections, pills, ultrasound wave therapy. So it's hard to really parse that out, but th that data on two to four point increase on a 25 point scale uh, is, is what average is. Um, I wanna come see you, how to set up an appointment? Call that number tomorrow morning, 7 a.m. and we'll get you in. Um, uh, will this slide deck be available for download? I don't think it's available for download, but we do upload this webinar on our YouTube channel. And so you can kind of go through it there and, and, and look at it. Uh, do I make an appointment with you or my current doctor at the urology group? Either or, okay. Uh, you know, I, I'm happy to see a, a, any and all patients. Uh, if if you uh, want to do a deep dive into your your sexual health, um, and and 
I, I think that's fine. And you can certainly see your current urologist. And if they think that, you know, if they don't do, let's say, some of the injections or penile implants or something, you know, they can they can send you over to, to, to see me or one of my uh, partners who specializes in, in, in sexual health. Um, how long is the Almaduo effective? One year, two years, or what? Uh, I, I think I answered this. I, I don't think we, there's no way any any uh, thing that is not the implant we cannot answer that for penile implant. Ninety four percent work uh, 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 after within the first seven years. Uh, there's a six percent revision rate at seven years, so I can answer that because it takes out patient factors with uh, any of the other treatments that you it's, it's you really can't. Uh, answer that, I, I think. Um, are office visits by most Medicare insurance covered by Medicare? And what does office visit cost? I don't know the answer to that. I, in that, I don't know what it costs. Medicare generally it does cover our off, uh, office visits, but just call and, and schedule an appointment and, and we can help with that. I'm 80 and have CHF and AFib. Is anything safer for me? Look, I mean, I don't think age is is a, is a reason not to, let's say, do a treatment option, right? So, so yeah, if, if you're 80 and you're on nitrates for chest pain, I can't give you Viagra or Cialis, right? So that that's, you know, you have to look at the nuance, but, you know, I, I've done uh, just a, a month or two ago, an 86 year old, we put a penile implant because he was healthy. His cardiologist said he can undergo surgery. So who am I to say an 86 year old can't have sex? I, I, I'm a firm believer that every patient should have their own choice. And if we have an informed discussion, we, you know, we're, we're adults and, and we, we make what's the best call for you. Of course, there's risks in life, but, you know, hey, we, we, we drive our car to work. We, we you know, you can't, you can't live your life scared of, of, of failure and risk, okay? You know, we, we, we go through it and we use our experience and our expertise to, to minimize risk and do our best. And, and if, you know, we, we can go up. But being 80 is not a reason that we can't treat you. If you, if you want to have sex, we can help you. Um, is the implant covered by insurance? So we'd have to run the numbers. Generally, we see Medicare has great coverage on this. It's covered. Uh, and then a lot of commercial carriers, unless you have exclusion on your plan, will cover it. Uh, Medicaid generally does not. Uh, but we, like I said, we have to uh, run the numbers. Um, is Shockwave the permanent fix? Uh, I, I, I don't think there's any permanent fix, I guess. Uh, yeah, even a penile implant is not a permanent fix. It can fail. So, so you know, there's nothing, nothing is, nothing is permanent. Uh, with implants, will it also make the glands look natural or will it look at the flaccid state and wrinkled? Okay, great question. Um, so, so that is probably the main difference between a natural erection and a penile implant erection. So the shaft is, is nice and rigid, but the blood supply to the head of the penis comes from the urethra or the corpus spongiosum. So it's a totally different compartment of the penis. So yes, there can be some uh, flaccidity to the head of the penis or the glands. And so, you know, uh, that is something that we, we do sometimes see. So there's things we can help with that. You know, you can take a, a sildenafil before sex and then, or do some foreplay and then pump up the implant and it can trap some blood there. But that is maybe a little bit of a difference, but generally the rigidity of the implant uh, is enough to overcome that for penetrative intercourse and for certainly maintaining uh, an erection sufficient for penetrative intercourse. But that is probably uh, a, a little bit of a difference between a natural uh, erection, let's say, uh, and, and one with an implant. But one thing I always tell patients is, you know, when they say that, oh, you know, well, I don't know, I don't know, it's that if we, if we are at the point that we're talking about an implant, your natural erection is probably not you know, anything to, to write home about, right? So it's, you know, forget what you were when you were, in, when you were in your heyday in, in high school or in college. That is not what it is today, right? You need to accept reality and see what is the status quo, where is your erection right now, and what can it be with a penile implant? So yeah, even if the head is a little floppier than it used to be, that's, you know, better than it is you know, what, what you're dealing with right now, likely if we're having that discussion in the clinic. So you know, I, 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 I think that's something to always keep in mind. Um, I live near the Blue Ash office. Can I do my initial ED consultation there or do I need to go to Norwood or the Eastgate office? No, absolutely. We have some excellent uh, doctors in the Blue Ash location. You should uh, absolutely see them. And if they think uh, you need some specialized care, they'll send you over. But a lot of times, you know, the, the initial management of erectile dysfunction is, is managed 
uh, well by, by all of my partners who are excellent urologists. Uh, can an implant be done with tachycardia? I mean, I think if, if tachycardia just means an elevated heart rate, uh, I think if your cardiologist clears you and we can manage that intraoperatively, absolutely, 100%. Um, does a past Eurolift procedure have any effect on Alma Duo? Uh, no data that I've seen about that, I think, uh, should should be unrelated. I think I think if you're uh, you know responding to Viagra Cialis and have mild to moderate erectile dysfunction, then uh, potentially absolutely Almaduo could could be a benefit to you. Uh, my prostate has been removed. My PSA is less than uh, 0.1. Will I be a candidate for a penile implant? I would say you are one of the best uh, candidates for a penile implant because generally patients who've had their prostate removed may have more severe forms of erectile dysfunction similar to our diabetic patients. And so going through the whole rigmarole of this to this to this, you know, I, I say cut to the chase, you know, I mean, if you've tried all these things, let's, a penile implant is actually an excellent option in patients who, who, who have uh, uh, have, have had prostate cancer and, are, you know, have survived and, and, and want to regain that part of their life. One other thing I'll, I'll mention is that patients who've had prostate removal, they may have a leakage of urine when they cough, sneeze, stand up. So in those patients, um, we want to, uh, uh, we can also put a sling in at the time of a penile implant that when you inflate it, you don't leak during sex. And then even when you're kind of doing your normal activity. So th those are options too. So if, you're, if you've had your prostate and you're leaking urine, um, please come see me. That is one of my, my most gratifying visits we can have because we can uh, really help you get out of pads and diapers and that, that, you know, it's very hard to have sex if you're leaking on your partner. So there's ways we can help address that. Um, I had surgery for Peyronie's. Can an implant still be done? 100%. Uh, I think that uh, implant is actually a great option. The gold standard actually in patients who have erectile dysfunction and Peyronie's disease uh, together, you, you know, with, you, you would want to uh, put a penile implant in and they can uh, really help with both. Um, are long-time retreatments required for Almaduo after the six treatments? This is a great question, actually. This is an ongoing area of study right now uh, in, in the field. And I do think the answer to this is yes. Uh, I think that if you have a good benefit to the Almaduo wave therapy, generally a touch-up uh, six months out, potentially with two or three or six treatments is, is not a bad option. And we're having patients who do that. It's kind of similar to you know patients who, let's say, get Botox. Cosmetic Botox, yeah, you can do it, but then six to nine months later, you're going back and getting it done again because things change. Things kind of need to be retouched up, redone. So I do think that, you know, the data is still, we're accruing that, but I, I in, in my estimation, it is something that maybe need to be done. Um, approximate cost of the penile implant surgery. So, so generally, like I said, insurance will cover this, but if it is a fully, out, if you're going to pay out of pocket, it's about $20,000. So it, it's pretty expensive, uh, but, you know, uh, we do have, some patients uh, at times who will undergo it and, uh, you know, it's an investment in your health at times, but, you know, generally I'd say that may be one or two patients a year. Okay. Uh, who, who do that? The mo vast majority, few hundred that we'll probably do in our practice will be insurance. Um, how do we go about prescription? So your urologist will prescribe them and, and you pick them up and I know I want our pharmacy is excellent. We have uh, excellent, uh, you know, uh, reviews from patients about our, our, our level of service and professionalism. And I think, uh, you know, we can definitely help with that. Why doesn't Medicare cover this? Don't they think sex is good for your health? Medicare covers the flu, but not ED. Uh, you're preaching to the choir. I, I, I think they will at some point cover Alma Duo, but right now they don't. So, uh, yeah, I'm with you. Pellets, is that radiation? No, pellets, by pellets, sorry, I meant uh, this is something... Um, like called testapeller, it's pellets of testosterone that you can surgic, not surgically, but like it's a procedure in the office. You will implant them uh, and, and they emit testosterone. So it, it, no, not radiation pellets, but testosterone pellets. Um, is Almaduo covered by insurance uh, in patients who have been treated for prostate cancer? No, it's Almaduo is not covered by any insurance in the United States currently. Europe it is, uh, but not, not, not here. Um, Having problems with ejaculation, uh, I, I don't know what else more to say. I, I, we need more information and, and to go over with that. The costs we've done. Uh, does blood in the semen after radiation mean there's a problem? Good question. I mean, I think we'd have to 
take a look, but generally what can happen is after radiation, the prostate can get a little, what we call friable. So, so when you ejaculate, it's, you know, it's a stimulating event and then the blood vessels, because they're not, the integrity is not as good can burst and there can be a little bit of blood in the semen. So generally blood in the semen, I'm not as worried about. It's pretty self-limiting. If it's not blood in the urine or blood in the stool, different situation after radiation, but, uh, you know, we'd have to look into it, but you know, speaking in generalities, blood in the semen after radiation probably is okay. How often would sound wave treatments need to be redone? Uh, answer that. Um, pills don't work for me, but I've tried, I haven't tried injections yet. Are they covered with blue cost insurance or should I go straight to implants? Um, numbers would have to be run, I guess is the answer to that. I, I don't know uh, off the top of my head. We'd have to look at your specific plan. Um, you know, I think that that's always a, a interesting question. Like when you can do injections or implant, what should a patient do? I have a lot, I think I, patients go 50, 50. I think some patients will just don't want to do a needle because the spontaneity is not as good. You got to wait if the erection lasts too long, you're in the ER. So they just say, they just do a penile implant one and done. I think that's fair. Some patients, they want to try injections first and they have good, good success and they like it. So I think that's fair too. If you're on the fence, it's not a bad idea. You can try the injections because you can always do that. And if you don't like it, go to the implant, but you can't put the implant in and say, okay, no, no, I don't want, like once it's in, that's the final step. Now, not to say that it's a bad step. There's over 95%, let me repeat that, over 95% patient and partner satisfaction with the implant. The most common thing we hear is, I wish I did it sooner. So, you know, I, I don't think that it's something, uh, you know, it's, it's just something you have to decide for yourself. Um, is there a medically recommended pump or manufacturer? Um, so there's, I think you're talking about for the penile implant, that there's two on the market right now in the United States. There's the uh, Boston Scientific and the Coloplast. Um, it just depends on your surgeon really and, and what their preference is. So, so uh, the, the, the implant I use is the Boston Scientific. That's the one uh, we, we used always at the Cleveland Clinic. Uh, they've done it for 30 years there. I think I, it's, it's the one that I prefer. I think the feel to me is better. It has an antibiotic coating. Um, and and I, I just think it's an excellent product and, and, and just really uh, works well. So that's, you know, but there is a uh, coloplast as well. Um, will oxycodone cause ED? This is a great question, actually. So, so the, I don't know if oxycodone will cause ED, but there's evidence that, that uh, patients who take opioids chronically will have low testosterone, like really, really low testosterone. And that can be an option, a, a problem, and that, that can precipitate ED. So that would be what I would kind of look into. But no, certainly, yeah, they, it, it's not inconceivable to me that, that chronic opioids could, could have some hand in ED. Uh, so uh, yes, uh, someone said I'm on blood thinners. That's fine. We can deal with it. I have, I have blood flow when taking Cialis, but can't keep an erection. What should I do next? So yeah, if, you, if, if Cialis is working, I mean, I think that actually Alma Duo, as long, you know, if you, you should call that our number and, and get a consultation, but that, that may be something to at least consider before you go to something invasive like injections or a penile implant, but, um, you know, something to consider because we have definitely seen patients who have issues maintaining where that Alma Duo can help to stimulate that uh, pathway. Um, is there any downtime after implant surgery? So for me, uh, the main thing is the first week after the procedure, you are a bit bruised and swollen. So definitely take a week off work. And then it's four weeks of no heavy lifting over 15 pounds. Um, so that's kind of, and we can write that off for your work uh, as needed, but that's generally the main downtime. How long do the Almaduo treatments last? So generally it's the, the protocol is six sessions. Each treatment takes about 15 minutes. Uh, and you know, it's, you do one to two a week. Um, do you deal with a blue ash location? I personally don't go there, but I have many uh, excellent partners who, who are there and, and can help. Um, cost, we've done that. Pills don't work for me. Uh, and they've tested my nitric oxide levels and they're low. Wow, okay. Is there anything I can do about raising my nitric oxide? Uh, so nitric oxide is, is part of the erection pathway. We generally, I would tell you, I, I don't test that you know, that often this probably sounds like a men's health clinic has been doing this. Um, really not that I know of that, that I would say is in the AUA guidelines to raise your nitric oxide levels. I mean, uh, the PD-5 inhibitor is because the, the way that pathway works, you know, it, it does have some effect on that. So the Viagra and Cialis, but you're saying pills don't work. So really speaking, I think you're looking at one of the other options. 
uh, with either an implant or injections at, at that point. Um, if you have an implant, does blood still fill the penis? Is it loss of sensitivity? So generally sensitivity is unchanged, okay? Uh, and then blood, yeah, yes, there's still blood in the penis, right? Because otherwise the, the penis would fall off, right? But uh, in the chambers that blood used to fill when you had a good erection, now you have cylinders. Yes, there'll be a bit of blood around the cylinders, but you know, mostly it's it's the cylinder that's in there. But you know, there's still blood in the urethra, around the urethra, at the head of the penis. So there is still blood uh, in the penis. Uh, in coverage. Is there any treatment for retrograde ejaculation? No, for retro. Yeah, I'm assuming that's retrograde. Um, yeah, there's some treatments. So it depends. Um, you know, it could be because you're taking Flomax or you've had a prostate procedure like a TERP or something. So it, it depends on what the cause of it is. But yes, there are some people will, will there are some uh, stimulants, let's say like uh, pseudoephedrine and stuff that can be given, but it just depends. It's a, bit, it's a little more of a nuanced question. And so uh, it depends Are you trying to have kids, you know, is it for fertility or, or what's your goal? Uh, it, it generally, when we look at retrograde ejaculation, um, are blood transfusions needed during surgery? Great question. Uh, for penile implant, knock on wood, I, I have never had to give a penile uh, implant procedure, a blood transfusion yet. And, we, you know, we've done a few hundred now. So um, I guess anything's possible, uh, but uh, not as of yet. Um, you suggested that malleable implants resolve the issue of inverted penis. Does an inflatable implant result in greater length in a flaccid, non-inflated penis? Um, so yeah, the 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 uh, so so look, I think that there is a, the Boss Scientific has a type of implant called an LGX length and girth enhancement. So when the penis is flaccid, I think it gives a little more, let's say, body or fullness to the penis. But is there more length? I, I, I'm not convinced, right? So I don't think if if there was something that could give a man more length to his penis you know, I would be the first one getting it. And then the patient would be the second. I always tell patients that. So, you know, we will put the biggest penile implant we can in for the patient. There's no reason that I want to shortchange anyone. But, you know, the problem is that patients tend to think about their erection length when they were 25 years old. Now you're 65. There is a, there, every year you have erectile dysfunction, you are losing about half a centimeter of penile length because you're not getting good oxygenated blood flow to the penis. So it's, you know, I always think about, you know, those, Two or three percent of men that that in the data are unhappy with an implant. Why are they unhappy? I think it's there's a fixation on length, and it's not that the implant robs patients of length. It's erectile dysfunction. Not treating it in a timely fashion robs you of length. So um, I think that you know the implant maybe gives you some body or fullness to the penis. Does it give you length? Maybe, but, I, I, but if that's your goal, I, I don't think you may, you may be one of the two to 3% who are not happy. So I don't, I would say think twice, but if your goal is, hey, look, I wanna have a fulfilling sexual relationship with my partner where I can maintain an erection sufficient for penetrative intercourse, you will be happy uh, likely with a penile implant. Um, What is MUSE? Good question. MUSE is an intraurethral suppository that uh, of alprostadil can be uh, play, given for erectile dysfunction. So I didn't mention it because it's used to be given a lot more. We rarely give it now because we, we found patients had uh, urethral burning, discomfort, narrowing or strictures in the urethra. So it is an option. I can't think of the last time I've, I've had a patient we've given it to, but it, it is something that can be given. Do you also treat premature ejaculation? I sure do. Uh, you know, there are certain things we can do for that. There's um, topical desensitizing sprays, cognitive behavioral therapy with our sex therapist, Christy Haas, or, you know, you can actually use some anti-depressive uh, medicines, SSRIs for their side effect that they increase latency period or make it so you uh, don't ejaculate as fast. So yes, no, I, I do treat PE. Um, do implants augment size or girth to your normal erection? No, uh, you know, I, I think that, uh, like I said, there is a length and girth enhancement implant. It maybe gives you a little bit, but if that's your goal, I don't, you know, I, I don't, we don't promise that, you know, you're gonna have a bigger penis that, you know, that, that's that's not what the penile implant is, is, is for. It's to get you a penetrating penis. Um, it's better than what you probably have right now if we've come to that point, but, um, you know, a, a patient who's 25 and wants a bigger penis should not get a, a, a penile implant. That doesn't make much sense. Um, 
Can all normal activities like swimming, running, biking be continued with an implant and need to be avoided? No, good question. No, I think once you've healed, that's the key thing. You want to wait like four to six weeks, but then yes, you can do all those things. Uh, and generally there's, there's no problem. Once a penile implant has been implanted, what level of pain is there after surgery? So generally, you know, patients uh, do quite well, you know, because we, we, it's, it's done through one small incision, maybe rarely a second incision in, in very select cases, but generally patients do quite well. The level of pain is very well managed. Um, we do give uh, here and there narcotics. We try to avoid it if possible, but rarely do patients, I'd say, use it. Uh, but it's, it is it's something that that is well managed and, and we give like a, a block during surgery uh, with with um, uh, local anesthetic directly into the penis, into the chambers. And, and you know, our anesthesiologists, we, we do so many, they're well trained on our protocol and patients generally wake up quite comfortable. Um, does Flomax interact with any of these treatments? Um, I don't think so. No, I think we have many patients who are on Flomax who have ED and we, we kind of treat that. Um, did you say five days to return back to work? So I'd, I'd say generally you will definitely want a week off work, if not even the second, I'd say half my patients take even two weeks off. Um, but you know, some patients go back in that second week and they're fine. But if you go back and you're overdoing it, then taking off a few more days is not unheard of and it's not uncommon and you know, it's, it's fine. Uh, my PCP has said that Viagra can cause heart palpitations. Is that true in your experience? I guess anything's possible, but no, I think what I more see is this flushing headache, maybe a bluish hue to your vision, um, maybe a bit of heartburn here and there, but no, I mean, I guess it's possible, but not, not, not as much. Um, oh, I was looking for vacuum pump recommendations. Uh, so, so actually look, so vacuum pumps, it's hard. There's so many, uh, um, manufacturers and it's something that each male's Penis, you know, may have a different one that that kind of fits their dimensions. Now we have one that we sell out of our pharmacy that I think is is good for let's say the majority of patients. So that's why we picked that one um, out of Augusta Medical, and so, so they they would um, our pharmacy can can get that to you. Now I'll tell you if that doesn't do it in some patients, it doesn't. Then I actually recommend they go to a sex store. Okay, and a lot of the, those people, the the, the clerks who work there have excellent knowledge on, on vacuum devices. And, you know, it's one thing, it's hard that you can't try one, you know, so, so you have to kind of, it's a bit of a leap of faith, I guess. Uh, but, but, you know, uh, we, we do offer one through our pharmacy too. Um, what is my thought on penis rings? I think they're fine. I mean, I think generally you would have to use them in conjunction with uh, a vacuum device. You know, the, the giddy device is one that comes to mind that you can buy online, but no, they're fine. Um, uh, I think that's all I have. Um, so I guess there's one last question here, not for length fixation, but hitting the toilet with accuracy. So I think this is a patient who probably has a buried penis and then peeing, you you can't get a, you know, you can't aim. So yeah, penile implant, actually a malleable, helps to push out the penis when it's flaccid, and then you can grab your penis and aim it a little better. And so that uh, is, is an excellent option. And sometimes malleable implants are actually uh, a good option in these patients because it's a small incision actually near the head of the penis takes 20 to 30 minutes actually to do the procedure no pump no reservoir so less risk no risk of device malfunction so i think it's something that is excellent i do i, I do a decent amount of those and, and and works well so um i think that's all the questions i i have um thank you so much for tuning in tonight and taking ownership of your health uh, I, I commend you uh it's a new year let's all take good care of ourselves and, and those around us and let's, uh, you know, make it a good year. So please come in and, and, and see us at the urology group and, and, and we would, uh, we would love to help. Okay. Thanks. Um, have a good evening, everyone. Thank you.